Morning. Morning. Who's this guy up here with his toes sticking out of his, out of his sandals? Um, if I don't know you, my name's Daniel Deuce. I'm the discipleship pastor here. Um, I got injured a while back, spring break actually. Um, and so thank you for those of you who have reached out that have been praying for me. My leg's healing well. Um, continue to pray for me. It has been, it's been a hard week. Um, I was in the ER again on Monday. I have, this wound has woken the slumbering giant of my immune system and it's decided to, I have an autoimmune disease. So it's just like, it's pounding me. Um, so yeah, be praying for me. I figure I can share that with you guys because many of you have been praying for me and I really do appreciate it. Um, but also just to be weak in front of you, to let you know that pastors struggle too. Um, so yeah, with that, if you are physically able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Our scripture passage today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to read all of chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. It's going to be good. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord again, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were cut off, lying there on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon remained. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its surrounding territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what should we do with the ark of the God of Israel? So they answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they've brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered again together all of the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place so that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Y'all pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Thank you for health and strength and vitality enough to, to make it here. Thank you for resources and transportation ability to, to get here, and to be here and gather with your people, to sit under your word. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just you would do what you promised to do and you would produce fruit from the scriptures. You would produce fruit in our lives. Um, you would change, use it to change our, our minds and our hearts and, and, and stir our affections, Lord. Draw us uh, to you, draw us to your son. May we hold him high, may we behold him. Uh, may we worship him more fully. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. Sometimes even when we can't see, when we don't know where to go. Let it shine this morning um, and let us leave here different. 
Speak to us, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Who are the Philistines? It's been a minute, right, since we talked about the Philistines. I think it was like Palm Sunday, maybe. How did they capture the Ark of God? For some of you, like, you just got here. You're like, I don't know where we are. This, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Well, they're talking about gods and Dagon and hands and tumors. What is going on here in this place? We're not, we're not that crazy. What's the backstory? Okay, we have to do this. We have to do this work. How do we find ourselves in this situation? Remember, 1 Samuel, Samuel, this is a, this is a biblical narrative, okay? It's a story, all right? And we have to pay attention to characters anytime they're introduced. Setting, when the setting changes, right? That's how they communicate. If we skip all that, we miss what the authors were trying to communicate to the original readers, right? That's hermeneutics. We have to try to figure out what the original readers, were, what were their takeaways? What would they have heard? What would they be paying attention to? How would it be affecting them? Then we use that to allow God to help us be affected by it. Does that make sense? It's not just like, oh, let me just read it like, like it was written to me yesterday. Like, no, that's not, we can't do that. That's lazy, okay? Um, so I'll give, it, I'll give you this. I'm gonna compare it like we're gonna do some Star Wars comparison because I really don't know, I mean, American pop culture, like we just, we know Star Wars, okay? Even if we don't watch Star Wars, my wife has never watched Star Wars. She won't watch Star Wars with me, but like, she knows who Darth Vader is, you know? Like, nobody's just oblivious to Star Wars, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna use it a little bit. So think of chapters four, chapter one and two were like Hannah, right? Hannah had a problem, then Hannah prayed, then we have Eli and his sons, then we get Samuel, right? That's one through three. Then four out of nowhere, you know, the Philistines, they're introduced, okay? And so you're, we're, gonna, we're gonna see this as like an episode, right? Or like, you know, one of the Star Wars episodes. I don't know. Chapters four, five, and six are an episode, okay? A little mini series. Um, in chapter four, the ark gets captured by the Philistines, okay? Chapter five, which we're going to read today, I don't really know what to say other than the ark goes on like a victory tour. I don't know, summer jam session fest or whatever. It just travels around and smashes the, the, the Philistines. Chapter six, the Ark gets returned. Ark gets captured, Ark defeats the Philistines, Ark gets returned, okay? That's like the section. And we're gonna, you gotta kinda like read it like that and then go back to all of the things and compare so that you can take away the things that the authors wanted us to take away, okay? So let's review. What happened in chapter four? I think it was Palm Sunday, Pastor Johnny, he was here earlier, he uh, opened us up to chapter four. If you missed it, go back and watch it. It was, it was good. Um, but we're introduced to this group of people called the Philistines, okay? This is the first time that they are mentioned in 1 Samuel, okay? Um, thus far, it's been about Hannah. We've read about Eli and his boys, and we've read a lot about Samuel, okay? But this is the first time we have the Philistines enter, and you can almost hear like, bum, 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 bum. Remember that one? Who is that? Darth Vader, right? The villain is introduced. The conflict is introduced. Okay, this is how they told stories. The Philistines just know, I could do a bunch of background work. It's not that. The Philistines are the bad guys. Okay, that's what you need to know. They're bad guys. They are the bad guys of 1 Samuel. They're mentioned 127 times in 1 Samuel, the most of any scroll that we have, actually judges in, 1, in Samuel. Um, it's, like, it's like a Spielberg movie, okay? Who are the bad guys in all Spielberg movies? Okay, whatever. The Nazis, okay? Think Indiana Jones. 
Like the bad guys are always Nazis. I guess sometimes Russians, but that's kind of, there's Russian Nazis maybe or something. It's Nazis, okay? Philistines are, they're not Nazis, but they're bad guys, okay? Just think bad guys. Now, um, again, we want to read this like as much as possible. We want to take on the mind of the original audience. So when they hear Philistine, when was the last time that the Philistines were mentioned in the Bible up to this point? And all the stories they grew up in, like, what would, they, what would they remember, right? Everyone's childhood, at least boys, little boys, favorite childhood story was Samson. Samson, um, Judges 13 through 16, you know, defeats the Philistines. That was the last time that the, that the Philistines were mentioned, okay? Um, actually, Judges 32 times the Philistines are mentioned. Um, now, I'm going to read this. Just bear with me, okay? It's fun. It's exciting, all right? But I want us to take on, I want us to see what's happening, and I want us to experience this as much as possible like the original audience would have experienced it, okay? They would have been reminded of this story. I mean, instantly, okay? It's not a question. So if you're not familiar, remember, go back and read it. It's super easy read. It's quick, 13 to 16 of Judges. I'm going to read just the end of chapter 16, okay, the last time that they're mentioned. Now, at this point, if you're not familiar, I don't know if you remember the lady named Delilah, right? She's kind of a, she's sort of a bad guy too, right? She's like a Philistine lady of the night or something. Um, I don't know what to call her. Uh, so she has tricked him. She's had his head shaved at this point, which Samson was never supposed to do because he was a Nazarite, so his strength has left him. And it actually says the Lord had left him. I mean, the shame, like he's got nothing. The Philistines then capture him, gouge out his eyes. So his head shaved, he's blind. His eyes have been gouged out. And he's grinding grain at a mill in a Philistine prison in Gaza. Okay, but it says his hair is growing back. Verse 23, now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed so many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson so that he can entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young men who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained them. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O oh God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And then he bowed with all his strength and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Boom! Isn't, I mean, is that not a favorite childhood story right there? This story... Samson's story right here, this is what would have immediately come to mind when in chapter 4 of 1 Samuel, they read Philistines. Do you see that? The Bible's so cool. All right, so we got to go back to, to chapter four, right? We got to read this and then contrast it, and we're going to experience this like the original audience, okay? Now, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, all right? No Hannah, no Samuel, no Eli and his sons. 
Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Exclamation point. My brain just went off. I remember Samson. I remember the judges. Philistines are bad guys. Oh, man. What's about to happen? Is God going to smash all of our enemies again? How's he going to do it? Who's going to win? So we introduce the conflict. We introduce the bad guys. Darth Vader, right? The plot thickens, okay? So what happens in chapter four? We're not going to read the whole thing again. But round one, Israelites get smashed by the Philistines, okay? It's like a mini smash, all right? And then the Israelites are like, oh, no. Why did God smash us? Oh, it's because we left the ark back in Shiloh. Duh. So they go and they get the ark from Shiloh and they bring the ark like it's a lucky charm or something, you know? Ooh, we forgot the ark. Like it's some sort of, you know, magical trinket or something. It's like a cult. Like God's, as if they could control God's presence and power with this box, right? You, to use it for their own win, their own personal benefit. Yeah, round two. Okay, so they got the ark this time. Round two. Oops. The Philistines smashed them even worse this time. And they capture the ark. What? Plot twist. Who saw that one? Like at the end where Luke gets his hand chopped off? Nobody saw that. Come in, dude. Are you serious? Oh, his hand like falls down the thing, you know? Like, and then the movie ends. You're like, what? Come on. That's what just, that's what happened. The ark was captured. How could God have let this happen? We were defeated twice and the ark is, is, is gone? And chapter four ends. The glory has departed from Israel, the kavod, the weight, the glory. The glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Chapter four ends. Defeat. God has abandoned us. Where is he? Why would he do this? Why would he allow himself, his people, his enemies to win? What, why, why would he do this this way? Chapter 5, verse 1. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now, I'm visual, okay? I'm an artist, sort of-ish. I'm visual, so I have to have a map. My brain doesn't function. Like, I have to figure out what this looked like on a map, okay? So I'll give you guys maps throughout this thing. But you'll see, this is kind of chapter four, that, that red line at the top. They're at Ebenezer and Aphek, right? That's where they first meet in chapter four to have this, these battles, okay? And so chapter four, they send back to Shiloh. Um, they bring the ark. They get defeated the second time. And then the ark gets captured right there at Ebenezer, okay? And then what it just said is they took it from Ebenezer down the coast through Philistia, which is kind of west, southwest land of Canaan, right, from Israel, and they take it to the coastal city of Ashdod. So we're on the coast, okay? You see that? Then the, that's where uh, the, temp the, the main temple for Dagon is also. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God, and they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Now, just for fun, you know, it's for fun, we have to talk about Dagon a little bit. And he's like, I don't know, a merman guy, okay? He was the actually um, competing Philistine, Mesopotamian, Sumerian, Phoenician. Like, he's an old, old, old school creator god, okay? He is a, like Zeus, all right? He's a father of gods. He's actually the father of Baal, who we're going to talk about later especially in Kings, he comes up. But Baal, Baal worship, um, he's the father of Baal, okay? So he's a big deal. He's their main god, all right? He 
Could have been the god of the sea, obviously, for those in Ashdod um, on the Mediterranean right there, which was a huge, I mean, it brought it gave, it, all of life and abundance was provided from the sea. Um, the sea, the grain, or the storm. Baal was the god of the storm, and he was the father of Baal. Uh, he was thought to give abundance and prosperity. He was an original fertility god. Uh, personally, I, when I see this picture, I think of King Neptune from SpongeBob. I don't know if you guys watch SpongeBob, or I watched it before I had kids, so that's just, that's who you're dealing with up here this morning. Um, and there he is in his temple, on his throne of sorts. Throne of thrones, reading the, reading the, the paper, sorry. I have to make light a little bit because... He's a false god. He's, he's a joke, you know? He has, it's a joke. It's funny. Um, okay, verse 2. Then the Philistines took the ark of God, and they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon, and they set him back up in his place because, you know, he needs help like that. Round 1. God wins this time. Verse 4. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both of his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon remained. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Round 2. God wins again. Big time, this time. He smashed that guy, right? I have to read this quote. In my, in my, in my prep this week, I, I have like commentaries that I look at, and this guy, anyway, I'll just read it. I don't know. Is it on the screen? Maybe. Dagon's belittlement is telling. Removal of head, hands, or other body parts was standard treatment of enemy dead in the martial cultures of the ancient Near East, including, including Israel all throughout the Old Testament. The Philistines had thought their God to have the upper hand over Israel's, but now they find him both headless and handless. And they themselves will soon be feeling in their own bodies the heavy hand of Yahweh. You have to hear that. I don't know if y'all remember in Samson, there's a lot of mention of hands. And now again, we're here in this little section, only in this little section right here, we have hands again over and over and over. These are the tools that they had at their disposal, the original authors. These are the, these are the clues. These are the ways that they would remind us of things, that they would awaken our imagination and our memory and help us to connect the dots so that we could take away what we're supposed to take away from the story. Is that amazing? It's so cool. Sorry, I might be a nerd, but I love this. This book is just unreal. Okay, so now Dagon has been defeated, right? He's been defeated, dismembered, unhanded, right? Humiliated a bit. God now begins his defeat of the actual Philistines themselves. Their God smashed. Now he's going to smash them. Okay, verse six, the hand of the Lord was heavy. It was kavod, weight, glory, heavy. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and the surrounding territory. Okay, now um, I'm gonna read a little addition. I don't know if it's on the screen. It's from the Septuagint. So the Septuagint, is the oldest Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible that we have, okay? And there's just, you know, there's variation here and there, but in, in the Septuagint, they add here, he, the Lord, God brought up mice against them, and they swarmed in their ships. Then mice went up into the land, and there was a mortal panic in the city, okay? So the word tumors that we see here and that we're also gonna see in chapter six next week um, it just is a, is a Hebrew word. It just means hill, mound, like a, a bump, right? 
this came to mean, I mean, when it was spoken of in this way, like a bump, a boil, a tumor, a hill-shaped mound, okay? A hill-shaped growth. Like if you got a hill-shaped growth on you, it's not good. I don't know if you ever had a boil or seen a boil. It's no bueno, okay? Um, and the mention of rodents here in the Septuagint in this chapter and then also in the next chapter, there's going to be mention of rodents. Uh, most people, most scholars believe this was like bubonic plague, okay? Verse 7, just a little background, so we're all like kind of on the same page. This is what the Philistines are thinking too. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand, his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, all the lords answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel to Gath. Gath is about 11 miles inland. Okay, what is that? East, southeast? I don't know. Is it up there? Maybe. Um, maybe they thought, oh, we'll get this thing away from the coast, away from the mice, and all the tumors will go away. All the bad stuff will go away, right? It was not uncommon at all for, like, port cities. Port cities were used to, like, pestilence, disease. It would enter on, it would come on ships, you know? Um, on rodents or on things like it would be it would be in 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 cargo you know and people would get sick like it was it was it was common okay and so they're like oh let's get this inland and all this bad stuff will go away it'll stop right so they took the ark of god to gath uh verse nine here we go but after they had brought it around to gath the hand of the lord was against the city causing a very great panic and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. Well, that did not work, apparently. We immediately regret this decision to capture the ark. <laughs> Verse 10. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They've brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and all our people. They sent therefore and gathered together again all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel. Let it return to its own place so that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. It was ma'od heavy is the Hebrew. It was ma'od kavod. Kavod is heavy, glory, weight. It was ma'od kavod. It's funny. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. We have to read this in light of chapter 4. You have to compare the two stories, or this won't make sense. The Israelites in chapter 4 had tried to use the ark to defeat the Philistines, right? Right? as if this fancy golden storage chest had some kind of power in and of itself. Like, we're just going to put this, you know, in front of our army and win automatically. They thought that they could just wield the power of God, control the power of God with this magical box. And God says, no. No, that's not how I work. I am God, and I will not be manipulated. I will not be used. I will not be controlled. I will accomplish my plans. I will accomplish my purposes. How and when and through whom or through what means I so desire. I mean, who is it that does the defeating of the enemies here in chapter 5? This is 1 Samuel, right? We've had Hannah thus far. She was, like a, she was a hero of the story. We've had Eli and his sons. 
We've, we've had Samuel. The, the scroll is named after Samuel, right? Where's Samuel? Do we see Samuel anywhere in 4, 5, or 6? <laughs> Eli's dead. The first, the only, the ultimate defeater of these enemies is God himself. Let's go back to chapter two and read Hannah's prayer. If you ever get kind of lost, confused, you're in, you're in first, second Samuel, Hannah's prayer in chapter two is basically like the table of contents for the whole thing, okay? There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed Messiah. God allowed the capture of the ark in chapter 4 so that he and he alone could defeat his enemies. He doesn't need an army. He doesn't need a single soldier or a sword or a spear or a horse or a chariot or a trumpet, right? In Jericho, I don't know. He doesn't, he needs zero help from us or anyone else to get his, his plans accomplished. This is the gospel. We don't get to contribute a single thing. Nothing. All the good deeds I've done, they don't win me any more favor with God. God, look at how I've served. God, look at what I've given up. God, look at the sins I used to commit. I don't do that stuff anymore. Look at the good stuff that I do. Can I have some more favor? Can I have some more blessing? Is that not the manipulation? Is that not the attempt to control? Is that not the attempt to use God like we just saw? The gospel doesn't let us do this. And it's such a gift. Look at my obedience. Look at what I've given. Look at how I serve. God says, that was me. That was me the whole time. Any good you did, any sin you left, no one wants God in and of themselves. God allows us and draws us to himself. If we get to obey, if we get to repent, if we get to turn, it's because he puts that in us and he empowers us to do it. It's because he loves us. It's because he calls us. It's because he chooses us so that he can put his power, his glory, his mercy and his grace on display through us. But it's not about us. I mean, it is, we get to be a part, praise his name. But ultimately, this is his victory. Jesus allowed himself to be captured Jesus allowed himself to be dragged off into enemy territory. He allowed himself to be beaten and broken and abused 
and mocked and ridiculed and spit upon and made fun of. He allowed himself to be defeated so that he could defeat his enemies and ours. He could defeat death. He could defeat Satan and demons. He could defeat hell. He could defeat our sin. He defeated it. Defeated all of his enemies and our enemies. And then what does he do? He, he makes us, he makes his enemies, which we all once were, he makes his enemies his friends. What a God. Not by the might of man, not in any way we expected him to act. It's completely backwards and completely surprising and completely upside down. And it's just overwhelming and so good. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed Messiah. Y'all pray with me. Father, thank you for your story. Thank you for the scriptures, which all point to Jesus. All authority has been given into the hand of your son, Jesus. We exalt him, we honor him, we behold him, we lift him high. Lord, allow us the gift to see him as he is, to, to worship you more, Lord, for, for who you are, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for defeating death. Only you could. We couldn't help. We couldn't contribute. We couldn't, we couldn't defeat this enemy. We, the story of the Bible is that we try over and over and over and over, and we just fail over and over again. You had to do everything. There was no other way. You were the only one who could live the perfect life. You were the only one who could willingly lay your life down as a perfect sacrifice. And because of your obedience, you were the first to be raised. Only you could do that. God, we praise you. Thank you for this story. Thank you that even now you're calling and drawing us to yourself. Continue to move and speak in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every week, well, most weeks, we get to come celebrate at this table this bread representative of the broken body of Jesus and the cup, his shed blood that he allowed to be broken. He allowed to be shed. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. 
just like he allowed the ark to be captured, Jesus allowed himself to go to the cross. It was what he came here for. For love. And every week we get to celebrate. We get to reconnect. We get to be renewed by the truth and proclaim this death that he died for us together. Proclaim the defeat of all of our enemies. I know sometimes it feels like they're still winning, but they're defeated, man. It's only a matter of time. They only got so much time left. He wins. He has won, and in the end, he wins. It's not going to be a question. If you need a minute to like reconnect, if you need a minute to, to just be with him, that's what this is for. This is a sacred time. Nobody's going to think you're weird because you're sitting and praying, okay? That's what this time is for. <laughs> but whenever you're ready, y'all come to the table. Let's celebrate and receive the gift of his death and his, def his victory together, okay? Y'all come down, receive the elements down the center, and then return to your seats on the side. Whenever you're ready, come to the table.